Welcome to World War I Centennial News, episode number 82. Thank you for listening. And we also want to invite you to follow the show on Twitter at the WW1 Podcast. You can ask us questions, make comments, get a link that you missed, see pictures from some of the stories, and even ask us to drop a note to one of our guests for you. That's at T H E W W, the number one podcast. Because, of course, it's more than just a show. It's a conversation about the events a hundred years ago this week and the World War I centennial commemoration happening now about the war that changed the world. This week, we explore the idea of ambulance, and especially the American Field Service with archivist Nicole Milano. Mike Schuster gives us a powerful description of the trenches a hundred years ago. Dr. Edward Lengel lines up what units are fighting where and takes us to the front with the Rainbow Division and Douglas MacArthur. The new 2018 World War I commemorative stamp hits the post office and we're joined by an old friend, Rebecca Wilson, who tells us about the early days at the commission and how the stamp initiative got started. Citizen historian Andrew Capitz is here to tell us about his book, Good War, Great Men. Kathleen C. Wyatt and Harry Belangi share the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project from Cape May, New Jersey. And of course, The Buzz, where Catherine Akey highlights the commemoration of World War I in social media. It's a jam-packed podcast that is brought to you by the U.S. World War I Centennial Commission, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, and the Star Foundation. I'm Teo Mayer, the Chief Technologist for the Commission, and your host. Welcome to the show. The scale of injury and physical trauma in World War I hit new previously unimaginable heights in human history, as you'll hear from both Mike Schuster and Dr. Edward Langell. In response, how the wounded were treated and field medicine generally completely transformed in World War I. But before you can treat a wounded warrior, you need to get them from the battlefield to the doctor. And that's the theme for this week's show. Our catchphrase is ambulance. And as you'll learn by the time the show's finished, the term itself has a history that predates vehicles. Now, with that as a premise, we're going to jump into our centennial time machine and go back to the years just prior to World War I to see how a hospital in Paris was the foundation for how the wounded were transported from the battlefield in the war that changed the world. We've landed in pre-war Paris. Now, it's very popular for wealthier Americans as well as aspiring artists to come here. It's exciting, it's cultured, and it's naughty all at the same time. The expatriate, or the American overseas community in Paris, is defined by the River Seine. On the left bank, you have the artists, musicians, philosophers, and writers. The right bank is inhabited by the Gilded Age, upper-class families like the Vanderbilts, Goulds, Morgans, Whitneys, and so on. Now, these Americans want American doctors and American medical care as well, so they come together to establish and fund a hospital in Paris for themselves. Our longtime listeners might remember our story about this hospital back when we ran it in early December of 2017, in episode number 49. Then we spoke with Anthony Easton, the director of the documentary film The American in Paris, which tells the story of L'Hôpital Américain in and during the course of the Great War. Okay, so the hospital is paid for entirely with private donations, much of it coming from the right bank families. About $10 million of individual contributions builds, staffs, and supplies the hospital, which opens to much excitement. Sterling Heilig of the Chicago Record Herald describes it as the jewel of Paris, the most spick and span luxurious scientific brand new little hospital in Europe. Okay, back to history. So now it's August of 1914. 
A war breaks out because a crazed radical kid assassinates the crown prince of Austria. Now, nobody thinks of it as a big deal at the time, but Germany takes the opportunity to decide to roll through Belgium and push into France, expecting an easy military snap and grab of Belgium and France to expand their empire. Because after all, that's how you expand empires. Well, in early September, the invasion gets to within 30 miles of Paris. And that's when the French and the British muster up, counterattack, and stop the German advance with the First Battle of the Marne. It's a turning point that precedes four years of global mayhem that, in retrospect, will become known as World War I. Meanwhile, the hospital prepares itself to receive patients. But a problem remains. The wounded French are having trouble getting evacuated to the rear. Instead, they're being clustered in churches and farmhouses and little villages all across the front. Hearing this, the hospital summons anyone with a car. Now remember, in 1914, the car is a brand new idea. It's mostly for the wealthy and the totally leading edge. Well, those that have them are gathered together and they take off west towards the front, including members of the governor's board. The cars arrive in the dead of night near the front, and the volunteers bring back 34 soldiers on their first run, turn around, and immediately head out for more. With the railroads blocked or damaged, this by-the-cuff excursion serves as an example of what the motor car is capable of doing in the rough terrain of war. So now, a guy named A. Piot Andrews. Now, he's the former director of the United States Mint and an assistant professor of economics at Harvard. Well, he volunteers as a driver for the American Ambulance Hospital in January of 1915. So, that experience at the First Battle of the Marne, heading out to the front for the wounded, well, that's unusual for the hospital in the first year of the war. Piot finds himself primarily ferrying patients from the train stations in Paris to the hospitals around the city. However, he's a pretty sharp cookie and quickly realizes that more can be done to save lives. And in April of 1915, he successfully negotiates with the French army to have some ambulance sections of the hospital work closer to the front lines of the battle. This is the birth of the American Field Services, also known as the AFS. The AFS becomes an absolute icon of the First World War, and it offers the opportunity for many Americans to serve in France, Belgium, and the Balkans before the U.S. involvement in the war. Their Ford Model Ts, used to transport the wounded, become known as, quote, ambulances. And they shepherd hundreds of thousands of men to medical care in the course of the conflict. So to provide us more insight, we've asked Nicole Milano, the head archivist and historical publications editor at the American Field Service Intercultural Programs, to join us and tell us more about the AFS during the war and throughout the 20th century. Nicole, welcome to our history segment. Thank you for having me today. Nicole, even though we just provided an overview of the AFS, can you tell us a little bit about the American Field Service during the war and how it grew over the course of the war? Now, AFS worked with representatives back in the U.S. to recruit ambulance drivers and also raise money for their growing ambulance service. It was so successful that AFS ultimately broke away from the American Ambulance Hospital to become an independent volunteer organization with headquarters in the heart of Paris. Motorized vehicles were kind of rare at the time. How did the AFS decide that that was the way to go? That's a great question. And AFS was really revolutionary in their use of the Model T Ford ambulance, and particularly in their standardization of this vehicle. By standardizing the kind of ambulance, it would just simply make more sense. The ambulances had interchangeable parts, which made them easier to repair. They were also small, meaning that they were quicker and more efficient at driving over the shell pocketed roads. Now, officially, three stretchers or four seated soldiers could fit in the back of one of these ambulances, though they often squeezed in many more. And we've even heard stories of some of them riding on the top of the wheels on the way out just so that they could really evacuate as many men as possible. The volunteers had a very close relationship with these ambulances, and they often gave nicknames to them. And many of them actually slept in these cars during the war. And actually, there's an interesting story as well. What they did was they ran the motor very quickly, which made the water in the radiator boil. And they actually made something called radiator water cocoa from this water. 
Sounds like it would have a taste to it. Yes, I would imagine. Maybe not the best cocoa you've ever had. <laughs> well, I, I imagine under the circumstances, maybe it was. Yeah. Well, we just got a question from our live audience. Henry Ford was publicly against the U.S. entering the war. Did he ever change his mind and donate some of the ambulances to the AFS? That's a great question. And actually, we never got a discount from the Ford Motor Company for the thousands of ambulances that we purchased during the war. However, as a volunteer organization, our drivers were unpaid. We actually recruited and also fundraised for money on the home front from communities and families like the Vanderbilts, the Fricks, the Whitneys, who donated money to buy ambulances during the war. So we may not have had Ford himself, but we did have a lot of supporters that did help us. One of the fascinating things about the ambulance drivers is that we know the names of a lot of them. Can you tell us about that? We had a number of famous AFSers, including several who belong to the famed Lost Generation. The writer Harry Crosby and the artist Waldo Pierce both drove an ambulance with AFS. Also, Malcolm Cowley, who is actually a truck driver with AFS and not an ambulance driver, is often regarded as the unofficial historian of the Lost Generation. We also had a number of volunteers who went on to do other great things and perhaps may not be quite as famous as these Lost Generation writers. Now, one of the questions that I'm asked the most is whether Ernest Hemingway was an ambulance driver with the organization. And I have to say he was not. He was actually a volunteer with the Red Cross in Italy. Similarly, Dos Passos and E.E. E. Cummings were also volunteers with other ambulance corps during the war. Well, now, some of the Lafayette Escadrille pilots, the pilots that flew for the French before America entered the war, some of those were AFS drivers first, weren't they? Absolutely. Eight of the Lafayette Escadrille pilots were actually former AFS drivers, including James McConnell, who was tragically shot down in 1917 during aerial combat. What was the typical day in the life of an ASF driver? The typical day could be long and tiring. They worked at dressing stations that were located around 800 yards from the first line trenches, and wounded soldiers were carried by French stretcher bearers from the trenches to these dressing stations, where they would then receive basic medical attention before AFS transported them to hospitals farther along. Now, the AFS volunteers couldn't use lights when driving on the road at night for fear of an attack from above. They also sometimes had to wear gas masks because they were driving through very difficult conditions. And in Verdun, one of our drivers writes in his diary that he couldn't sleep for 35 hours due to the number of soldiers they transported. The AFS operated ambulances again in World War II. What happened between the wars and then what happened after? That's a great question because many people don't realize the connections between AFS and World War I and AFS intercultural programs and international organization of today. So between the world wars, AFS actually started a graduate fellowship program that sponsored graduate students to travel between French and American universities. One of our French fellows was actually Raymond Albrecht, who was a French resistance fighter during World War II. Now, as you mentioned, AFS, of course, was reactivated as an ambulance corps during World War II. And at the end of World War II, the drivers from World War I and II got together and tried to decide what they could do with this organization. They had witnessed the horror of two world wars and wanted to create an organization that might actually contribute to a more peaceful world. So by working together in 1946, they created an intercultural and student exchange organization that is now known as AFS Intercultural Programs, an international nonprofit organization that helps people develop the knowledge, skills, and understanding needed to create a more just and peaceful world. So we still consider ourselves a volunteer organization with 40,000 AFS volunteers around the world more than 100 years after our founding. That's great, from Radiator Coco. <laughs> to International Exchange, exactly. Yeah, I love it. AFS does focus a lot on education now, and we did create a curriculum about these World War I volunteer efforts. That's available for free for secondary school teachers worldwide. So if they want to learn more about that, they can go to the volunteers.afs.org. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great interview. Thank you for having me. And that's the story of how the transportation of the wounded changed the very definition of the word ambulance, the structure of battlefield medicine, and volunteerism 100 years ago in the war that changed the world. Many thanks to Nicole Milano, the head archivist and historical publications editor at the AFS Intercultural Programs, and to our great research team here at the World War I Centennial News Podcast for pulling the story together.
We'll be posting images of ambulances and their drivers on our Twitter feed, which is at the WW1 podcast. We also have our research links for you in the podcast notes. As you heard a little earlier, Ernest Hemingway was not a volunteer ambulance driver for the AFS, but for the American Red Cross. This week, our friends at the Great War Channel posted a story about him. Here's host Indy Nidell from the Great War Channel on YouTube. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to a Great War bio special about Ernest Hemingway and the First World War. Ernest Miller Hemingway was born July 21st, 1899 in Oak Park, a well-to-do suburb of Chicago. He graduated high school in June 1917, but did not go to university, taking a job instead with the Kansas City Star newspaper. He only worked there for a few months, but would use the paper's style guide as a foundation for his later writing. Use short sentences, use short first paragraphs, use vigorous English, be positive, not negative. Watch the entire clip by going to YouTube and searching for The Great War or follow the link in the podcast notes. And now Mike Schuster, former NPR correspondent and the curator for the Great War Project blog. Mike, your post this week directly confronts the human horror of the fighting at the front, regardless of the uniform the soldier bears. It's a really powerful post and you don't hold back. So a note to our listeners, especially if you have children listening, the following contains very graphic descriptions of violence. It was a horror, actually, Teo. The headline reads, Intimate Pictures of War in the Trenches. An American flyer describes warfare on the ground. For one American officer, never have I seen so many dead men. But Paris is safe. Special to the Great War Project. Fighting during these days in France on the Western Front 100 years ago has been called horrific by both sides, victor and vanquished alike. Never have I seen so many dead men, one German officer writes, nor so many wounded, the wounded on both sides being vulnerable and afraid, writes one American medical officer. Some of them cursed and raved and had to be tied to their litters. Some shook violently. Some trembled and slunk away in apparent abject fear of every incoming shell, while others simply stood speechless, oblivious to all surroundings. For two days, writes historian Martin Gilbert, it looked as if the Germans might make the final decisive breakthrough. In one sector of the front, however, French gunners succeeded in knocking out all 20 of the attacking German tanks. In another sector, 3,600 American troops outnumbered three to one, fought and held their ground in hand-to-hand combat. In the air, 225 French bombers dropped more than 40 tons of bombs on the bridges which the Germans had thrown across the Marne. 25 of the bombers were lost, but the attack continued. In one sector, the Americans blew up every pontoon that the Germans threw across the Marne, gaining for itself the title Rock of the Marne. As the Germans continued to pour down to the Marne, American infantrymen and machine gunners were waiting for them and mowed them down. On July 18th, in one sector of the Western Front, the American flyer, Eddie Rickenbacker, provided an unusually intimate picture of the slaughter unfolding just below in the American sector of operations. The barrage, he writes, seemed to be tearing up the earth in huge handfuls as it moved steadily nearer to the German trenches. To know that human beings were lying there without means of escape, waiting there while the pitiless hailstorm of shrapnel drew slowly closer to their hiding places seemed such a diabolical method of torture that I wondered why men in the trenches did not go utterly mad with terror. According to a story in Gilbert, Rickenbacker watched while a shell fell directly into the trench in front of him, tearing it open and gutting it completely for a space of 30 feet. Then the next instant, a German soldier emerges. He throws away his rifle and proceeds to run as fast as he can back toward the safer trenches toward the rear. Hardly had he gone 10 yards when a high explosive shell lit in front of him. As Rickenbacker tells it, in the next moment he was simply swept away in dust and disappeared as the explosion took effect. Not a vestige of him remained when the dust had settled and the smoke had cleared away. This had been a German attack, the goal to reach Paris. By nightfall, writes Gilbert, on July 18th, the German threat to Paris was over. And that's some of the news from the Great War Project in these days a century ago. Mike Schuster is the curator for the Great War Project blog. 
The link to his post is in the podcast notes. That leads to another segment of America Emerges, military stories from World War I with Dr. Edward Langle. Now, Ed explained to me that there is a sizable segment of the history audience intensely interested in which American units were involved in which specific actions and battles. Now, of course, the unit names are all described by numbers. So if you're not somebody who follows those details, just let the numbers wash past you because the story that Ed tells is really fascinating. And you get another larger-than-life character, Douglas MacArthur, who becomes a general during this episode. 100 years ago this week, the AEF won all in, and so did Douglas MacArthur. French forces with the U.S. 3rd and 28th Divisions stopped the Germans cold on the Marne River on July 15th. On July 18th, the U.S. 1st and 2nd Divisions assaulted alongside French colonial troops at the Battle of Soissons. Simultaneously, the American 3rd, 4th, 26th, and 28th Divisions with elements of the African-American 93rd Division, began the reduction of the German-held Marne salient. Then, the men of the 42nd Rainbow Division wrote their page in the history books at Croix Rouge Farm. The U.S. 42nd Rainbow Division, the third National Guard formation to arrive at the front, was one of the more colorful units in the AEF, pun intended. It was an amalgam of National Guard units from 26 states plus the District of Columbia. Douglas MacArthur, who eventually commanded the division's 84th Brigade, supposedly said that the 42nd Division stretches like a rainbow from one end of America to the other. The division's four regiments all had storied histories. They were the 165th, originally New York's Fighting 69th, the 166th, the 4th Ohio, the 167th, 4th Alabama, and the 168th, 3rd Iowa. Though proud of their origins, the Rainbow Men believed that General Pershing and his officers disliked them because they were National Guard. They had a lot to prove. The Rainbow arrived in France in the autumn of 1917, but hadn't yet seen much action. Held in the second line on July 15th, it helped to break up the last stages of the German attack, but not much more. MacArthur, then serving as Colonel and Divisional Chief of Staff, received a Silver Star and was eager for more action. Ten days later, he got it, and a lot more. It was tough sledding for the four American divisions tasked with reducing the German Marne salient, while the 1st and 2nd divisions attacked at Soissons. The 3rd, 4th, and 28th divisions all moved forward slowly, and the 26th Yankee division was badly blooded in repeated frontal assaults against German positions. Fresh support was needed. On July 25th and 26th, the American 1st Corps pulled out all three of its frontline divisions, including the American 26th and 28th, and replaced them with one, the Rainbow Division. The 84th Brigade, which was the 167th and 168th Regiments, led the attack on July 26th against German-held Croix Rouge Farm, or Red Cross Farm, which was a well-prepared position bristling with well-sighted machine guns. In their first attack, the green American troops clumped together in thick lines and took heavy casualties. They were beaten back. Later that evening, though, the doughboys spread out thinly and used combined arms tactics, wielding grenades, machine guns, and one-pounder light cannon as they advanced. Engaging the Germans in close-quarters combat, they captured the farm. MacArthur remembered that, quote, we reverted to tactics I had seen so often in the Indian wars of my frontier days. Crawling forward in twos and threes against each stubborn nest of enemy guns, we closed in with the bayonet and the hand grenade. It was savage and there was no quarter asked or given. Red Cross Farm cost over 1,000 American casualties. A short time later, MacArthur was promoted to Brigadier General and placed in command of the 84th Brigade. He later remembered his first visit to the front, writing, quote, I will never forget that trip. The dead were so thick on spots that we tumbled over them. There must have been at least 2,000 of those sprawled bodies. The stench was suffocating. Not a tree was standing. The moans and cries of wounded men sounded everywhere. Sniper bullets sung like the buzzing of a hive of angry bees. (laughs) 
Dr. Edward Lengel is an American military historian and our segment host for America Emerges, military stories from World War I. Related to Ed's story, today there's a powerful and striking sculpture at the Croix Rouge farm. And this week, there's a centennial commemoration there in France, being attended by some of my colleagues. We're going to post an image of this striking doughboy statue carrying a decimated victim and run some stories about the commemoration on our Twitter channel, at the ww one podcast And of course, we put those links in the podcast notes, including for Ed's post and his author's website. And that's it for 100 Years Ago This Week. Pretty dense, but pretty interesting. Now it's time to fast forward into the present with World War I Centennial News Now. As our regulars know, this part of the podcast focuses on now and how we're commemorating the centennial of World War I. This week in commission news, there is a new centennial commemorative collectible joining the U.S. Mint 1918 World War I commemorative silver dollar. This week, the U.S. Postal Service issued the World War I Turning the Tide Forever stamp. It's a really great looking piece. So anyone who's into snail mail, or if you're into stamp collecting, or you want a really great commemorative collectible for your kids or your grandkids, head to the post office and snag a sheet or two of these awesome forever stamps. I did. The new stamp was offered to the public in a first day of issue dedication ceremony hosted at the National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City. The stamp features a soldier wearing a steel combat helmet. In his right hand, he holds the pole for the American flag that he's grasping in his left. In the background of the stamp, you can see smoke and barbed wires against the yellow rays of the sky. Two World War I biplanes fly over the battlefield. The illustration is by artist Mark Stutzman, who's the same talent that created the renowned Young Elvis stamp. According to the Postal Service, the World War I illustration was painted using an airbrush on illustrator board, a technique that evokes the propaganda posters used during World War I. It's a great look. World War I Centennial Commissioner Deborah Anderson was a guest speaker for the ceremony and mentioned the effort to gain the support for the stamp. Quote, We knocked on as many doors as we could and wrote as many letters as we could to help the veterans to be remembered. We're thrilled that the Postal Service has chosen to provide them with this honor. As Commissioner Anderson points out, a stamp doesn't just happen. This grassroots campaign started at the fledgling U.S. World War I Centennial Commission at their very first official meeting on October 29, 2013, with a suggestion by Commissioner Jerry Hester. Joining us to tell us the story of this early initiative to get a commemorative World War I stamp is Rebecca Wilson, one of the original commission staffers and the former director of operations for the World War I Centennial Commission. Rebecca, welcome back for a chat. It's great to have you here. Nice to speak with you too. I'm glad to be back. So Rebecca, like most everyone involved with the Centennial Project and the commission, you started as a volunteer. Can you tell us a little bit about those formative days when things were just getting on their feet? My journey into being a volunteer with the commission kind of started before it even existed. I am a war veteran with two tours in Iraq, and I moved to the D.C. metro area. And on one of my first trips down to the National Mall, which is where all the memorials are, I came across the District of Columbia's local World War I memorial, which is right next to the National World War II memorial. And at the time, that memorial was in a state of disrepair. When I saw that, I thought about my fellow veterans and those people that we have told that we are going to remember the sacrifices they made for our country. And here I was thinking, we have forgotten, and and of all the places we have forgotten is right here in in Washington, D.C., amongst all these other great memorials. And that night I went home and I started doing research and I found Edwin Fountain, who's now a commissioner and started organizing cleanups for that memorial twice a year, along with twice a year observances at the memorial. And that memorial has since been restored to its original form of glory. And through that process, I kind of became plugged into World War I and Edwin Fountain. So when the commission was founded by Congress, I was one of the first to say, hey, I'm ready to volunteer. And I headed on down 
for the first commission meeting down in Kansas City, where they put me right to work. Through that, just started to get more involved in organizing everything that the commissioners wanted to do for the centennial. Great story, Rebecca. So one of the very early initiatives that the team took on was the stamp. Can you tell us about how that came around? Sure. So like I said, we were down at that first commission meeting and there was a lot of spitballing, like, what are we going to do for the centennial? And I remember it was Jerry Hester raised his hand and he said, we need a stamp. We need stamps, a series of stamps for the centennial. Then in 2015, we decided to make it a priority and we started doing research. How do we get a stamp? And we found out that we were already late. Stamps decide what they're going to do three years in advance, but we didn't give up there. And that's when we decided to start a campaign to get a stamp. So how did you go about building the interest and getting people on board to get that done? There was different ways to go about it. The Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee, which are the people that decide what stamps we had, take in letters for what the citizens want for a stamp. And we thought, okay, we can send in our own letter, but it's easy to ignore one letter. It's not easy to ignore a whole bag of letters or a constant stream of letters coming in about World War I. So we had a few options. Ultimately, it was decided that the most important thing is that we got a stamp for World War I and the specific details that was less important. So I think one of the key things we did is said, hey, any volunteer, any organization who wants to, we encourage you to write a letter, but you tell them which World War I stamp you want and why. Our volunteers and our organizations over the course of like six to eight months continued to push that. And we had a great response. The volunteers and the organizations like Congressman Cleaver's office, I think we even ended up hearing from the Army at the Pentagon, they all started getting involved in this process. And we just heard about more and more letters going into the stamp committee and just kind of created this groundswell by constantly keeping it in the foreground and asking people to write this letter week after week throughout that six to eight month period in 2015. So now that the U.S. Postal Service has issued a stamp, what do you think of it? And what do you think of the experience? For me, I don't think I realize the importance or the sweat equity that I had into getting a stamp until I found out that they were announcing the stamp. And I found out through Meredith Carr, she sent me an email. For me, I really burst into tears because I couldn't believe it. I mean, to put so much effort into something and to have it come to fruition, I was really taken aback, just in awe at what we could do. Since then, it's become real to me, you know, imagining people carrying it around or purchasing it or just seeing it on letters. That's important to me. To have the Postal Service say that World War I is important, I think it says something about like a tide turning for people commemorating the centennial of World War I. And it really gave me hope for the commission, and it really gave me hope for the National Memorial in Washington, D.C. Well, we've got a coin. Now we have a stamp, and we're going to have a memorial. Rebecca, you tell a wonderful story, and it's been great talking with you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Rebecca Wilson was one of the original members of the fledgling World War I Centennial Commission staff. The museum live-streamed the first day of issue dedication ceremony, and if you'd like to see it, we've put a link for you in the podcast notes. This week, in updates from the states, there's an exciting event coming up in Michigan, the Great Lakes state. The maquette, the scale model of the National World War I Memorial Sculpture, is shipping out from the D.C. area and deploying to the state of Michigan for their World War I Centennial event over here. The event is being held in the village of Grass Lakes and hosted by the Michigan Military Heritage Museum. It's going to take place during the weekend of August 3rd through the 5th. It's a commemoration it's a fundraiser, and anyone who's in the region, it's a chance to get a personal look at Saban Howard's amazing sculpture that will form the centerpiece of the National Memorial. The World War I Memorial Maquette Showing is being sponsored by the American Legion, AMVETS, the Commanders Group, and the Order of the Purple Hearts of Michigan. Links to learn more about the event, how to attend, and to learn more about the sculpture that's sure to become an American memorial icon are in the links in the podcast notes. This week for our Spotlight on the Media, 
we're joined again by Andrew Capitz, who describes himself as an insurance professional by day and history geek by night. Andrew was on the podcast in October of 2017 in episode 41 to tell us about the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project in Trafford, Pennsylvania. But Andrew is a busy guy, deeply immersed in the centennial. So this week, we're focusing on another aspect of his activities, talking about his book, Good War, Great Men, which details the experience of the 313th Machine Gun Battalion during World War I. Andrew, thanks for joining us again. Hi, Teo. Thanks for having me back. I jokingly use that title because it's my lighthearted way of saying I'm not an expert, but I have a passion for this history. <laughs> you certainly do. <laughs> so how did you develop an interest in the 313th? It goes back uh, a few years. Actually, before the National Museum was built for the Marine Corps in D.C., I was at a fundraiser in Pittsburgh at the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Hall, and I was standing next to my father, and we were looking into a display where they had this 1917 Browning machine gun. And my father said, oh, that's the type of machine gun my father shot when he was in France. It was a story I had no knowledge of whatsoever. I said, this is interesting. I have to understand what this is about. And that sort of led me down the road to doing the research on this battalion. That was the battalion your grandfather fought in? Yes, correct. Okay. A sneak preview on the book. Tell us a little bit about the 313th and what were they made up of and how did they serve? Yeah, so the 313th Machine Gun Battalion, they're part of the 80th Division, called the Blue Ridge Division. And they were draftees primarily from Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Virginia. A large contingency of them came from the Erie County, Pennsylvania area. And I had a quote from one of the officers in the battalion when he was writing home to his parents. He said, quote, I have a bunch of draft from Erie, Pennsylvania, and 32 of the 172 can't speak English. He says, my first sergeant gives his orders in English and then in Polish. I thought that was a great quote that came out of this research. What's the most interesting and maybe the most challenging part that you encountered trying to write this book? I guess first off, I didn't consider myself a writer. So I first was more of a researcher and I took many years just to dig up stories and the one interesting thing was the, the great men that were in this battalion. Many of them went on to become very successful men. Unfortunately, one of them probably could have been just as successful, but his life ended early on the Musargon battlefield. But I'm from the Pittsburgh area, and I came across this gentleman named Joseph Duff. And I found out that Joe Duff was actually the head football coach for the University of Pittsburgh, and he was the head coach for 1913 and also 1914. But he was a graduate of Princeton. He was a All-American at Princeton. After coaching, Joe Duff went into the officer's reserve training. And unfortunately for him, he was not commissioned, apparently due to a vision problem. But he was able to convince his local draft board to draft him. And he ended up in this machine gun battalion. He apparently impressed the officers in this battalion, and he was then sent off and commissioned with 125th Infantry. Ten days after receiving his commission, he was killed in the Musargon. His brother James, back in Pennsylvania, who later served as the Pennsylvania Attorney General, and it was actually the 34th governor of Pennsylvania, I can't help but think that Joe Duff himself would have been as successful as his brother had he survived. You know, that really is one of the great tragedies of war. The people that we lost and the potential that we lost, we'll never know. Absolutely. And many of these officers just being well-educated Ivy League officers in this particular battalion went on to do just great things. And unfortunately, the men who did not survive, you wonder what they could have done. And I, sometimes I feel that my research into this book is trying to tell the story of the men who didn't survive and being grateful that my grandfather did survive so that I could tell the history of these men so that people would not forget their sacrifice. Great closing to a wonderful interview. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Andrew Capitz, insurance professional by day, history geek by night, lecturer at various times and author of Good War, Great Men. Learn more about his book and activities by following the links in the podcast notes. Moving on to our 100 Cities, 100 Memorial segment about the $200,000 matching grant challenge to rescue and focus on our local World War I memorials. 
This week, we're headed to Cape May, New Jersey. Here to tell us about the project are Kathleen C. Wyatt, the Administrator and Secretary for the Greater Cape May Historical Society, and Harry Belangi, President and Historian of the Society. Kathleen, Harry, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen, how did you hear about the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials program? Well, it was a simple request. Harry and I decided to request the city to pass a resolution to refresh the memorial, clean it up a bit, and was written up by a local newspaper. And the headlines read, Woman Wants Memorial Refurbished. And you saw the article on the internet, and you contacted me by email, inviting us to join in the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials application. And we were one of the first 50 to be selected the following September. I remember being really excited because we were trying to figure out how do we connect with people that are doing things and let them know about this program and came across the article. I think our director of communications might have passed it on to me. So I just called you up or at least I just sent you an email. Yes, you did. And I said, Harry, should we try this? We're a small organization. And he said, why not? We grabbed the camera went over to the monument, which is in a great location in Cape May. People go by this monument daily, haven't got a clue what they're looking at. And we started researching it. And we found out that, yeah, it is World War I. It's the only one in Cape May County. And we were astounded. It took about two months to research the history. And we found the early days of the Progressive League and the John McRae Post. They were the two early founders of the memorial for the city. Very interesting. Now, Cape May itself is a very special location. I mean, your history predates the pioneers, and you played into U.S. history all along. Can you give us a brief overview of the history of the location? Our museum is a colonial house. It dates to about 1730. It was moved three times it was built by a paymaster of the Revolutionary War, Mamukin Hughes. He also ran it as a tavern. And 1878 comes along and Cape May has a major fire. Acres of Cape May are destroyed by the fire. This house was not. It was saved. About 1975, the bulldozers are warming up, not just for the colonial house, but for Cape uh -oh. May. Uh-oh. <laughs> Literally. When people came along, they're known as the cottagers, also known as the summer people, which we sometimes say. They brought in a wonderful woman named Carolyn Pitch, and she's a architectural historian, I believe, for the Park Service. Fell in love with Cape May. 1976 comes along. She writes a nomination to make Cape May in its entirety, which is the only city that is a National Historic Landmark. The Colonial House was saved by the Greater Cape May Historical Society. The city itself is actually a preservation at this point, isn't it? The city is a landmark in its entirety. That's great. What was the region's role during World War I? We had Camp Wissahickon here, a Navy base, a Navy training center. We have the Garden State Parkway, which ends just about at Cape May, and Camp Wissahickon was located in that area. About 1917, the city assumed the appearance of a cantonment. cantonment. This was the former Henry Ford Farm, and that was selected for Camp Wissahickon. It was made ready for naval training reserves, along with new aviators, including airships, hangars, barracks, and a base hospital were rushed to completion. The Southern Point was selected by the Navy because of our strategic location on the Delaware Bay and River and the ocean. Shipping channels, of course, go up the Delaware to Pennsylvania. So we went from a small city to this bustling, war-oriented, in many ways, community. And we did that twice. We did it World War I. At World War II. Yes. Here we get to the centennial and the armistice, and I was looking back through your records and so forth. You have some rededication plans for 1111, don't you? We do. We have agreed with the city to have a fairly decent-sized memorial service on 1111, and that is on Sunday. We expect to have a number of reenactors who will, if we find them and they fit into the costumes, will be here as a nurse or as a doughboy. We are inviting speakers from the state and from the local area and folks who actually participated with us in a number of projects that made this a reality for us. 
And it is just a thrilling event. And we're also planning to have a number of suffragettes to march with us because in the next two years, we're going to be celebrating the suffragettes, women getting the vote. So that's going to be yes. part of this rededication also. Yes. We're... Get them out there with those signs. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Theo. Thank you. Kathleen C. Wyatt and Harry Belangi are from the Greater Cape May Historical Society. Learn more about the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials program by following the link in the podcast notes. Following our theme of ambulance this week, the team suggested that we combine Speaking World War I, which explores the words and phrases from the war, and World War I war tech, because they both line up with the theme. So why not? Here we go. Ambulance originally comes from the Latin word ambulare, which simply means to walk or move. The word was used in a medical military context from very early on. For example, in the 1400s, Spain's Queen Isabella organized support for the wounded in battle. According to historian John S. Haler, the Spaniards used transport wagons and field hospitals known as ambulancias. As we head into the 1800s, a French military surgeon named Dominique Jean Laré pioneered modern battlefield medical practices and brought the word into the French military lexicon. Not only did he invent and coin the term triage, but he also organized ambulance volante, or flying ambulances, which were a system of men's supplies and horse-drawn carriages designed to move wounded soldiers from the battlefield as fast as possible. Meanwhile, for English speakers, the word ambulance came to mean just the vehicle part, a development that Haler calls a corruption of the word. As the British and the Americans corrupted the word ambulance, the subject referred to also underwent an evolutionary leap. The first motorized ambulances debuted in Chicago in 1899, signaling the end of the horse-drawn version. On the battlefield, while there's some disadvantages and very rough terrain, the motorized ambulances proved to be faster and easier to support than a horse. Early on in World War I, ambulances were often regular cars retrofitted to carry combat wounded. Later, military and volunteer ambulance services such as the Red Cross, the American Field Service, and the Norton Hargis Ambulance Service operated especially designed ambulances produced by some of the world's foremost automotive manufacturers. According to the U.S. Army's official history of the ambulance service in World War I, Ford, Fiat, Peugeot, and General Motors Company ambulances were severely tested under combat conditions that demonstrated their advantages in speed and patient comfort. While Peugeot and Fiat ambulances could carry more men, their weight and complexity became a problem the closer one got to the front. When you were near the fighting, the road conditions were poor, and the Model T-based Ford ambulances proved to be light, maneuverable, and amazingly robust, according to Professor Chris McDonald. You know, it's Yankee ingenuity at work. They served the American Field Service and later the U.S. Army Ambulance Service extremely well in adverse conditions. In a letter from a young driver, Kent Hagler, found in a book by Professor McDonald, he describes the half-obliterated roads covered by all manners of debris that drivers had to navigate. The ambulance motors sometimes choked on the poisonous fog of gas, forcing the drivers to move their wounded to the nearest shelter and wait for the day. On a particular mission, Hagler and his unit were quite literally driven to exhaustion, rescuing the wounded in the midst of poisonous gas and relentless artillery fire for days on end. At the end of the letter, Hagler noted that his car was practically unharmed, and after it had some minor repairs and had been washed of all the blood, it was as good as new, remarking proudly that he carried more wounded than any other car by a considerable margin. Ambulance drivers like Hagler ferried a staggering number of soldiers on the French and the Italian fronts. The American Field Service estimates that their volunteers drove more than a half a million wounded men. The work that these men and women did not only avoided the permanent loss of a soldier's service, but maintained the morale of those who remained to fight. 
A wound in combat, even a serious one, was no longer an automatic death sentence, and injured soldiers survived at a much greater rate than in past conflicts. World War I is frequently, tragically, a story of unprecedented slaughter, but the story of the ambulance is quite the opposite. It's a story of a recent innovation, the automobile, turned to save lives. The ambulance, an interesting word, an interesting war tech, and an interesting topic. We have links for you in the podcast notes and pictures for you on our Twitter feed at the ww one podcast This week in Articles and Posts, where we highlight the stories you'll find in our weekly newsletter, The Dispatch. Headline. Washington Memorial Chapel at Valley Forge becomes Bells of Peace partner. On November 11, 2018, at 11 a.m. local, everyone is invited to toll the bells in their community to commemorate the centennial of the armistice. Bells of Peace is our initiative to promote this remembrance, and signing up last week was the Washington Memorial Chapel at Valley Forge, who will proudly toll their National Patriots Bell Tower, featuring 58 bronze bells weighing in at 26 tons. We thank them for signing up. Headline, Heroes or Corpses, Captain Truman in World War I is a new exhibit at the Harry S. Truman Presidential Library. Read more about the extraordinary exhibit at the Truman Presidential Library. Heroes or Corpses, Captain Truman in World War I, which tells the captivating story of Truman's service in the Great War through never-before-exhibited photographs, personal letters, and more than 40 artifacts from Truman's personal World War I collection. Headline, Centennial of the Sinking of the USS San Diego off Long Island, New York. This week marks the centennial of the sinking of the USS San Diego off the coast of Long Island, Mysteries surround the sinking to this very day. Read the story created by the staff of the U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command about the history of the San Diego, the tragedy of her sinking, and how her wreck off Long Island remains a dangerous place to visit for divers a hundred years later. Headline, Right Blog, F. Scott Fitzgerald and World War I, The Crack-Up Essays. This week on the Right Blog, Former Army infantryman in Afghanistan and writer Colin D. Holleran discusses Fitzgerald's painful experience by looking at the lesser-known crack-up personal essays published in Esquire in 1936. Holleran, who explored PTSD and post-traumatic growth in his works, shortly thereafter, and Icarian Flux, walks us through Fitzgerald's post-World War I emotional journey. Headline, this week's featured story of service is Charles Wesley Darrow. Read the story of Charles Wesley Darrow, submitted to our Stories of Service page by historian Tracy Tomaselli. Charles Wesley Darrow was born in 1898 in Wallingford, Connecticut. He joined the National Guard in 1916 in New Haven, Connecticut at the age of 17 and served patrolling the Mexican border against raids before serving in France in World War I. Finally, our selection from our official World War I Centennial merchandise shop. Our featured item this week is our custom key tag, inspired by an original World War I poster. This key tag features the dramatic image of a bayonet advance on the enemy with the U.S. flag in the upper corner. The link to our merchandise shop and all the articles we've highlighted here are available in our weekly dispatch newsletter. Subscribe at www.cc.org slash subscribe. You can also send us a tweet at the WW1 Podcast and ask us to send you the link. And that brings us to the buzz, the centennial of World War I this week in social media with Catherine Akey. Catherine, what did you pick this week? Hi, Teo. I picked two stories in particular this week. The first is an article coming from the website Verdun 1916. The article tells the story of the construction of American cemeteries and the repatriation of American soldiers' bodies after the First World War. The article includes a number of videos showing the construction of American cemeteries across Europe, which was a big debate that formed in America at the time, as in Britain, as to what to do with soldiers who fell so far away from home. One point of view was to repatriate the bodies The other was to leave them in Europe, but to rebury them in designated cemeteries. Teddy Roosevelt, who lost his son Quentin in the war, 
very publicly supported the latter point of view, saying, quote, we feel that where the tree falls, there let it lie. Roosevelt's endorsement gave a powerful boost to the non-repatriation effort. Read the article and learn about the establishment of American cemeteries after the war by following the link in the podcast notes. And last for the week, the American Experience from PBS shared a great short video, including clips from their documentary, The Great War. The video focuses on American flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker, who died this week on July 23rd, back in 1973. Eddie Rickenbacker was America's leading ace in the Great War. He shot down more enemy aircraft than any other. He was arguably the most famous American of the war. Rickenbacker was very much a working class hero. He grew up poor. His father died when he was young. He had to quit school to raise the family. And he became a race car driver. He actually raced in the Indy 500 four times. By the time Rickenbacker and the Americans joined the war, the air war has changed. What you're seeing really is the emergence of the Air Force. Watch the whole video at the link in the notes. And that's it this week in The Buzz. And that's episode number 82 of World War I Centennial News. Thank you for listening. We want to thank our guests, Nicole Milano, Head Archivist and Historical Publications Editor at the American Field Service Intercultural Programs. Mike Schuster, Curator for the Great War Project blog. Dr. Edward Lengel, Military Historian and Author. Rebecca Wilson, Former Director of Operations for the World War I Centennial Commission. Andrew Capitz, Author of the book Good War, Great Men. Kathleen C. Wyatt and Harry Belangi from the 100 Cities, 100 Memorials Project in Cape May, New Jersey. Catherine Akey, World War I photography specialist and line producer for the podcast. Many thanks to Mac Nelson, our wonderful sound editor, who makes us all sound lucid and clear-minded. And a special shout-out to World War I Centennial Commission intern J.L. Michaud, who really stepped it up this week with some great research on our topic, Ambulance. And I'm Teo Mayer, your host. The U.S. World War I Centennial Commission was created by Congress to honor, commemorate, and educate about World War I. Our programs are to inspire a national conversation and awareness about World War I. And that includes this podcast. We're bringing the lessons of 100 years ago to today's educators and their classrooms. We're helping to restore World War I memorials in communities of all sizes across the country. And of course, we're building America's National World War I Memorial in Washington, D.C. We want to thank the Commission's founding sponsor, the Pritzker Military Museum and Library, as well as the Star Foundation for their support. The podcast and a full transcript of the show can be found on our website at www.cc.org. You'll find World War I Centennial News in all the places you get your podcasts and even using your smart speaker by saying, play WW1 Centennial News Podcast. The podcast Twitter handle is at the WW1 Podcast. The commission's Twitter and Instagram handles are both at WW1CC and we're on Facebook at WW1 Centennial. Thank you for joining us. And don't forget to share the stories that you're hearing here today about the war that changed the world. So long.